Good day, and thanks to turning to the Vermont Credit Union's live channel on Ustream, where we're broadcasting from the office of the Association of Vermont Credit Unions in Colchester, Vermont. I'm Joe Bergeron, and I want to welcome participants here with us and viewers from credit unions, cooperatives, and others around the state to today's broadcast on the changing health insurance scene in Vermont in 2013 and what employers and individuals will have to consider in coming months before those changes take effect less than one year from today. To help you understand the changes taking place and how they'll affect you, we've enlisted the expertise of Vermont's newest health insurance provider, the Vermont Health Co-op, which you'll also learn about today. Thank you very much. We're really happy to be here to talk uh, with you folks from the Association of Vermont Credit Unions. And I would just at the very beginning like to make a slight clarification. Um, the Vermont Health Co-op, which I'll be describing uh, a little later in the presentation, a little bit more about us, we are not yet an insurance company. We have applied for a license from the Department of Fiscal uh, Financial Regulation, which used to be Bishka. We've applied for a license, and you know what it's like, all of you dealing with Department of Financial Regulation. It's really their um, timeline, and so we're uh, in the process of uh, working on establishing our license and being able to call ourselves an insurance company. So we just need to make that point really clear. I've been asked to talk about what's going on in Vermont in terms of the health care um, activity, health care reform activity, uh, what's coming up in 2014, uh, how employers ought to be thinking and consumers ought to be thinking about preparing for what's coming in 2014, the role of these new health co-ops nationwide and what the impact of the fiscal cliff uh, has been on health care reform, um, which is, I think, something a lot of people have heard a little bit about but maybe need a little more detail. So that's the agenda that I'm going to be covering today. <clears throat> so first of all, what's coming? January 1st, 2014, because of the Affordable Care Act nationwide, in every state there will be something called a health insurance exchange. In Vermont, uh, the state of Vermont has decided that it will operate this exchange um, as a state. There are other states that have decided to take an option in the Affordable Care Act to let the feds come in and operate the exchange for them. But in Vermont, the state will operate the exchange and it's going to be called Vermont Health Connect. And that is the branding that they're doing now, Vermont Health Connect. Vermont Health Connect is really actually a web portal. It's like Expedia or um, Priceline or something like that where it's a web portal where people will go and look at the plans that are available, choose the plan they want, and uh, sign up for it through this web portal. It's also where people will file the information that uh, would be necessary if they want to try to qualify for federal premium subsidies which are going to be managed through tax credits for individuals. So that is all operated by the state through Vermont Health Connect. There's an opportunity uh, provided for insurance brokers and a group of people who are going to be trained and qualified by the state called navigators to help people who need enrollment assistance uh, to work through this web portal. Um, for example, someone might just fill out a paper form and then someone else helps them enter it in through the portal. But the whole thing is supposed to ultimately be paperless and electronic. Once someone signs up for a plan, then that information is shuttled off from Vermont Health Connect to the plan, the carrier that the person chose, and then the enrollment continues with the specific insurance company that you've chosen. So who can buy through Vermont Health Connect? Well, this is something that states get to decide, uh, ultimately. Uh, under the federal law, any individual buying coverage is eligible to buy through their state exchange. And this would be individuals without access to employer-sponsored coverage. So either they're unemployed or self-employed or their employer doesn't offer a plan that they qualify for. Small businesses, which in Vermont was determined to be businesses with fewer than 50 employees, are also eligible for Vermont Health Connect uh, to purchase there. Now one thing, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to be clearing my throat. I've got that cold that's going around. Um, in Vermont, unlike every other state that 
is running its own exchange. In Vermont, if you're an individual or a small business, Vermont Health Connect is the only place you will be able to buy insurance. You will no longer be able to go directly to an insurance carrier or go through a broker and buy directly from a carrier. You're going to have to go through Vermont Health Connect. An important thing to note about these rules, individuals versus employee, employer-sponsored plans, is the federal subsidies are available only to people who enroll as individuals. That's because the subsidy then would take the place of an employer contribution to a plan. So if an employer goes, a small business goes to the Vermont Health Connect to purchase for their employees, those employees as individuals will not be able to qualify for subsidies. And I'll get into this in a little more detail, um, I hope, and if you have questions you can ask about it, but you can see that this somewhat complicates the choice for employers because if you choose to go in as an employer, your employees can't get federal tax credit subsidies for their premiums. On the other hand, um, some employers pay high enough salaries that people would qualify for very small subsidies anyway. So it's, it complicates the decisions that are up that are ahead for employers and individuals. So what's going to be covered uh, through the exchange plans? And this is a really important point because Vermont has basically eliminated any other options except what's available on the exchange. Well, the first term to become familiar with is essential benefits and that is the legal the term of art for what is covered by the plan the feds ask each state to determine what they call the benchmark plan and that is the minimum coverage that every plan has to include for its essential benefits in vermont the green mountain care board designated the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont small group plans as the benchmark plan. That would be like the Freedom Plan or the High Deductible Blue Care Plan, whatever. It means what's covered, what services, treatments, etc. are covered by a plan. And when a plan is determined by the state to provide the adequate coverage, it's then called a qualified health plan. That's another important term. Now the, a the Affordable Care Act, which is abbreviated as ACA, that requires also pediatric dental and vision benefits to be added to the benchmark plans so that nationwide all kids, um, and that means under 19, under age 19, will have dental and vision benefits um, as part of the qualified health plan essential benefits. So essential benefits means whether it's covered or not. It doesn't mean how much you have to pay in cost sharing. It just means is that treatment or service or facility covered by your health plan. So then the second thing is how much cost sharing is there in the plan. And this is where we get into what you've heard about, the metal level designs. There are platinum, gold, silver, and bronze levels. And this was set up in the federal law. <coughs> and what those reflect is the actuarial value of a plan. And that means how much is the plan going to be paying toward the total claims that are filed. And as you can see in this chart, the platinum plan is a rich plan. It means that the plan itself is predictably going to pay about 90% of all the claims that are filed. Very rich plan. The person covered by the plan would end up paying no, probably no more than around 10% of anything that happens. Then you go down one rung to the gold plans. They, pl they are going to pay about 80% of all the claims that you file. The silver plan 70%, you'll pay 30%. And the bronze plans would pay about 60% of the claim and you would have probably about 40% of the cost as your own out-of-pocket cost. Now to give you an idea of, well, how does that compare to what I have now? Well, the old Blue Cross JY plans where there was almost no deductible and they paid 80 to 90% of everything, that's like about a bronze or, I mean, a platinum or a gold plan. 
the current high deductible health plans, the HSA, HRA plans with $1,500 to $2,000 deductibles, um, those are in the silver bronze range. Um, so, and, and of course, the premium for those plans is going to be pretty much dependent on what this cost sharing level is because every one of these plans, remember, cover the same essential benefits. They're going to all cover hospital, they're going to all cover physical therapy, they're going to all cover those treatments. The question is how much do you have to pay toward the total cost of the claims? So that's another description. Platinum, remember, the plan is going to pay almost all the claims down to bronze where there's a 60-40 cost share pretty much. So essential benefits, what's covered, actuarial value or the metal level, how much does the plan pay toward the co total cost, how much might you have to pay. So when you go to the um, you go to the exchange then and you make the choice of your plan, you're not choosing on whether something's going to be covered or not, you're choosing the level of out-of-pocket exposure. The Affordable Care Act actually set limits though on the out-of-pocket exposure. So the maximum out-of-pocket that anyone can pay across the United States for an exchange plan, for a qualified health plan, is $6,250 maximum out-of-pocket and the maximum individual deductible is $2,000. So that kind of puts a limit around what plans can be offered um, as far as the metal levels. Vermont's legislature added an additional limit. <clears throat> they established a separate maximum deductible just for prescription drugs. So the maximum anybody would have to pay out of pocket for prescription drugs in the Vermont exchange is $1,250 a year. And they also limited the number of high deductible health plans that health insurers can offer on the exchange. So those are the outside limits um, of, of what, what you'll see available on the exchange in 2014. This chart's really hard to read, but I can make an electronic copy of just the chart available um, so that you folks could get it uh, through the, uh, your group here through the association here, uh, but what this does is lay out exactly what the different co-payment levels, deductible levels, and everything are for the platinum through the bronze plans that are the standard plans. And this gives you an idea right now of what is going to be offered on the exchange. <clears throat> In addition to those standard plans that were defined by the Green Mountain Care Board, um, health insurers can also offer what the state calls choice plans and that is little little tweaks and innovations, um, different kinds of wellness offerings perhaps, different, uh, a narrower network of providers uh, which would allow the plan to negotiate a better rate with those providers and therefore have a lower premium. So if you're willing to give up a broad network choice to a narrow network choice, um, you may be able to reduce your premium that way. So um, insurers are able to offer a few little innovations, but for the most part, there are the six standard plans that all the carriers on the exchange will be offering. <coughs> so how many plans will there be? Well, right now, um, there can be possibly as many as three carriers. Uh, MVP, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, and if we are licensed um, as a health insurer, if the co-op is licensed as a health insurer, we would be a third carrier offering plans on the exchange. And as I said, our license application is pending right now. There will also be one or two federal nationwide carriers that could be qualified to offer on the exchange. This is part of the Affordable Care Act to allow employers who have employees all around the country to choose a carrier that is offering in more than one state. So there may be two, uh, up to two carriers uh, that are offered on the state exchange as well. So with the five carriers, the three in state, two out of state, times the six standard plans that every carrier has to offer, there could be as many as 30 plan options. 
and then if the carriers offer choice plans there will be some of those in addition but the variations are going to be in how economically the carriers can offer the six standard plans will they vary by on premium at all and but the biggest choices I think are going to be in those choice plans that the where the carriers propose their own innovations and I think Tom has something to say here yes or just just uh, that's a it's a great summary Gene I just want to provide a couple clarifications as I was listening uh, first of all uh, there will be uh, plans HSA plans or plans that you could have HRA um, attach HRAs to uh, so that part of the um, that financing mechanism will still be available um, as the grid outline there were some terms uh, that uh, in the RFP carriers or people filing like ourselves uh, had no choice in terms of what the benefit design was so a lot of the plans will look similar and in terms of the choice options it really um, there was no direction given there was some ideals and some goals but how those carriers respond and get there or the people that are filing uh, is yet to be seen um, so there will be some options there's no guarantee that they're gonna be choice plans <coughs> um, and I think that's one thing that we'll find out in, in the months to come is, is how people are, are looking at that what they're proposing what's accepted uh, and what actually makes it to the market the carriers who want to participate on the exchange and in our case you know not a carrier yet but we want to be licensed and then uh, offer on the exchange we responded to a request for proposals that Vermont Health Connect sent out and said any carrier that wants to propose plans that wants to offer the standard plans that wants to propose propose choice plans send us your plan and we will determine whether or not you will be able to offer qualified health plans so I think that's your point Tom is right. that we've proposed the choice plans but they don't have to accept our proposal they Correct. could limit all the carriers just to the standard plans that they've already Correct. defined which is one box and that's it or they could allow some of the choice plans that carriers offered and we believe that Blue Cross and MVP have also proposed some choice plans but it's all confidential under review by the Vermont Health Connect uh, administration right now so we we don't you know we know what we offered but we don't know correct. what anybody else offered correct. and none of us know yet whether they're going to accept them correct so that's that's the stage we're at now so in preparing for 2014 um, some questions that still remain unanswered will the bronze uh, HSA and choice plans be more or less costly than the current HSA HRA models that people are used to is there going to be something close in price to what you have now we don't know because we haven't filed uh, none of the carriers have filed yet for what the rates will be for their plans because we haven't been told yet whether our plan meets the standards that they want there are some limitations in terms of the maximum out of pocket and the breadth of what has to be covered and the limitation on the prescription drug deductibles and things that could make the plans more costly um, and that's I think why the choice plans offered an opportunity for carriers to find other ways to try to keep the costs down but we don't really know yet any of us what you know how these cho these uh, exchange plans are going to compare in terms of price we also don't know yet how many employers will continue to offer coverage versus sending the employees to Health Connect as individuals um, there are predictions one way or another that small employers with uh, kind of lower in the lower pay scales doesn't make sense necessarily for them to continue to offer coverage and they may just give their employees a little boost in salary and send them to the exchange as individuals instead <coughs> but the the real you know another complicating factor is if you if you're an employer and you pay for health insurance it's deductible to you and it's not taxed <laughs> for the employee if the employee gets a bonus or a raise or anything like that it puts everybody into a different tax situation especially with the increase in Social Security that just hit us all um, so 
again, there it's a it's a complicated question as to whether employers would want to continue versus uh, somehow cash out the employees and and let the employees go to the exchange as individuals. It's also unknown yet how the state is going to administer these tax credits and collect the premiums. There's a huge uh, information technology pro uh, project going on right now to build this exchange, to build this web portal, but the back office and you, those you're all in financial management, you understand the back office is the real problem here. How do you administer tax credits for individuals against their, you know, their tax filings and their payroll stubs and everything through a web system that also sends them to the right carrier, sends the carrier <coughs> the tax credit money and also collects premiums from individuals. This is all being built right now and uh, we're all hoping that it's done in time. This last one, what are the employer choices, has not been settled yet either. <coughs> Excuse me. We don't know yet how much latitude employers will have. Will the employer be asked to choose one plan, one qualified health plan from one carrier for all employees, which would be obviously the simplest way to administer it, or will the employer be allowed to choose the carrier they want and then let the employee choose the plan uh, or can the employer say well I'm going to peg my benchmark at the bronze HSA plan from the co-op or Blue Cross or whatever and um, the employee can choose the carrier to offer the plan or you can see there are all kinds of permutations of how this could be handled this has not been decided yet by the Green Mountain Care Board and the Vermont Health Connect administrators. So as far as you all making your choices, we don't really know yet even how broad your choices are. So this is something to stay tuned for. <coughs> the timeline is that open enrollment is supposed to be conducted between October 1st and December 15th of this year of 2013. If the state's timeline slides and they can't have that web portal ready for people on October 1st or if it crashes when everybody goes on October 1st, um, how are we going to find out and what is the plan B? Unknown at this point and uh, a cause for a little concern although this our state is working in concert with a couple of other pretty large states including Oregon we have the same vendor building our web portal and um, they're using a you know solid platform I think Oracle or something so the expectation is that since we're not on our own and we've got kind of a big gorilla out there in Oregon uh, helping uh, move this along that that it they feel like they will meet the deadlines but it's a lot to be done especially when you consider that Every small business that offers coverage now, everyone under 50, every individual who's covered by Catamount or covered by a direct policy they buy from a carrier, most of the people who are now in the VHAP program, which is um, a Medicaid program for people who are above the income eligibility of Medicaid, uh, the kids in Dr. Dinosaur, tens and tens of thousands of people are all going to go to the exchange their existing health plans go away January 1st 2014 they have to buy through the exchange so it's kind of an all-in situation the way that Vermont has set it up and really does depend on making these deadlines <clears throat> it's kind of hard to know what data or information employers need to make their decisions about whether to continue to send employee uh, to continue to offer or to send employees to Vermont connect as individuals. One thing to look at is what are the standard plan designs? Is there anything that looks really like what you've got now so that the transition can be easier that way? Um, once the pricing comes out, which probably is going to be in July or August, uh, it might be easier to start thinking about um, whether the employer wants to continue to uh, offer or, and also are the income levels of your employees such that they're likely to get good subsidies better than you could offer 
as a pr your own premium contribution. But those are the kinds of things that people need to be thinking about. How will the tax credits work? Um, we still aren't really clear on that, but again, they, tax credits are only offered for individuals who go to the exchange and buy the plan as an individual. And in those situations, the employer can't be subsidizing directly the premium. Um, that's under the federal law. The employer can give the employee a raise, which is then taxable, but the employer cannot in any way do what they do now in terms of premium subsidies if people go to the exchange as individuals. Does it, if anybody has any questions or thoughts of, about unanswered questions they have, it's helpful to us to hear what they are because then when we do education programs, we can try to get as many answers as possible. So I encourage people to send questions here to let us know, um, you know what seems to be outstanding for you because I've pretty much told what we know so far. Are there, if there are any questions? So as a reminder to everyone, you can... Um, post questions or comments in the chat box on the right hand side of your Ustream browser and people in the room with us certainly can feel free to ask questions at your leisure. Um, one question that came up, Gene, you referenced about um, you know the challenge it is in, in meeting this timeline for the state of Vermont as well as with other states and whatnot. So what do you think, I don't want to put you on the spot, but, I, I'm, but I'm going to anyway, what do you think will happen if um, you know January 1 comes, a year less than a year from now, um, or worse yet, the sign-up period starting next fall sometime, and the state system isn't ready, uh, but the insurers are, what's going to happen in the marketplace with all of that? Well, there is a slight escape valve in the law that, the, that Vermont passed, Act 171, last session um, in 2012, that says that if Vermont cannot be ready uh, in time, that the plans people have will be allowed to continue until they would have otherwise expired or until the state can roll those people into the um, exchange enrollment. So individuals would probably go first. They would let small businesses renew the coverage they currently have and then they would set up some kind of rolling enrollment in tw during 2014 uh, whether it's regionally done or by employer size or something else. But for the most part, and Tom has a lot of experience with this, having um, been the administrator of BRS, working with small businesses for several years, virtually all the small businesses renew on January. So right. in some states, it might have been possible to say, you will come into the exchange when your policy expires in March, in April, in May. but so much of Vermont's small businesses renew on January 1 anyway that we couldn't set up that kind of a rolling system. But av if they see that their timeline is slipping, I think they're going to have to set up a rolling enrollment system, but my expectation would be they would just take individuals first and let small businesses be pushed off because they've got to get, the state has to get the individuals out of Catamount and out of VHAP into the exchange in order to replace the Vermont funded subsidies for those people with federal money. That's a huge part of Vermont doing the exchange the way we've done is that Vermont is now spending well 18 million dollars a year of tax money subsidizing people who are on Catamount and if you get them off Catamount and into the exchange that money is replaced with federal money. So it, it seems logical and I and sensible and let's hope they do it that if they do slip on the timelines they'd focus on getting the individuals in let the small businesses continue their policies that they have and then roll them in but again it's limited to businesses of under 50 everybody in a business with more than 50 employees continues the way they always have and continues to work by with their broker or directly from a carrier or whatever. They're not affected by the exchange at all. Right, and, and we, we have no indication that they're, they're not going to make the deadlines. Right. They're, they're very aggressive uh, deadlines, but it's um, <coughs> they're working towards them. That's really why they are, they've, they've set up a timeline where uh, people who want to be in the exchange need to declare it 
in November. They, we've, there's already been a set of filings. There's more in March. I, I don't think there's any real reason uh, to believe that they won't meet the deadlines. Um, you know, will it be as pr pretty as, as and as smooth as they want it to be? Well, everyone's been involved with IT projects. There's always some workarounds for a subset of the population. But uh, I've got no reason to believe that they won't make it. Uh, they very specifically chose not to allow the exchange to be run in parallel with the existing uh, insurance infrastructure last year. They made that a conscious decision. So I think it's a, it's a priority for a lot of people to, uh, to make this happen and get it done. And um, again, there may be some manual uh, enrollment, but it's no different than what we do today. Uh, so I, I, it may not be as electronic and as seamless as, as people would like to see it year one, but I think it'll happen. The exchange will happen. Yeah, and when Tom mentioned um, the <coughs> people had to declare in November um, whether they were going to be on the exchange, he's, he's meaning the carriers. Right. Uh, the carriers and the co-op as uh, in pursuing our license to be a carrier had to make a declaration um, that we were intending to respond to the RFP to try to qualify our health plans. So that was the first big threshold. Uh, the next step is um, that we all responded to this RFP by January 8th. Um, and for the co-op, because a year ago is when we were filing to get the federal loan to start the co-op, this is basically the second year in a row that none of us celebrated New Year's. It was really, <laughs> and a year from now, of course, is the enrollment on the exchange happening. So um, three, in three in a row, three in a row, quite a, quite a set of New Year's celebrations. <coughs> So we expect by March <coughs> the state will have approved the plans that, that it's going to approve from our proposed plans. And, by, and in March of this year, then the carriers are going to have to file the rates with DFR um, that the carriers would need to charge for those plans. Um, DFR will review those and at this point, the timeline predicts that they would be announcing that sometime, uh, the rates would be approved or disapproved uh, or negotiated or whatever by July, mid-2013. So that's the first time the public will really be able to connect a premium with a plan design. That's the first time we'll really have that information. Then uh, the carriers will start publicizing uh, marketing, you know, openly marketing these uh, qualified health plans from probably as early as August or so, right through the open enrollment period um, in December of this year. As I mentioned, the open enrollment through the portal is uh, suggested to be starting October of 2013. The plan coverage, if all goes well, then would start January 1st midnight plus one minute. Um, the old plans will go away and the new plans uh, through the Vermont Health Exchange will begin their coverage January 1st, 2014. So unless there are questions, I'll jump right into explaining about the co-ops. Well, co-op doesn't really stand for an abbreviation for cooperative. It is a term in the Affordable Care Act, consumer-oriented and operated plan which luckily abbreviates to co-op. Um, during the debate on the Affordable Care Act, which was a long time ago now, 2009-2010, uh, there was a debate about on these state exchanges, would there be a public option health plan offered? And the way that that was conceived of was that there would be, you know, United Healthcare, Aetna, Blue Cross, whatever, and the state Medicaid program, or the state, in Vermont's case, maybe the Catamount program, but a plan offered on the exchange you could buy into that was actually operated by your state. That was called the public option. It was a very hotly contested fight in Congress and failed. Ultimately, there were too many people who didn't want to see the beginning of kind of a Medicare, Medicaid for all model and so they wanted to keep the options on the exchange co basically commercial or private health insurance plans. 
but a coalition formed, started by Kent Conrad, Senator Kent Conrad from North Dakota, who was probably a champion for credit unions as well, um, on the Finance Committee. He started a coalition of people to support the Affordable Care Act, at least supporting and engendering the formation of quasi-public operated health plans that would be consumer driven and operate only for the benefit of consumers to try to at least rest the insurance insurance industry um, control into some set of plans around the country that would be consumer operated and oriented and that's where they came up with co-op as the name for these organizations So the Affordable Care Act and the regulations that were issued by um, Health and Human Services at the federal level establish what these co-ops look like. And they have to be member-owned, member-governed, meaning the boards are made up of members who are elected by the members. They couldn't require them to be cooperatives in, in terms of their corporate structure because not every state allows cooperatives to operate for all kinds of industries and Vermont is one of those very limited in Vermont you can't be a cooperative unless you're doing energy food housing Um, there may be one or two other things but not health insurance so the federal law requires them to be either a cooperative or a nonprofit corporation and says that any adult who's covered by one of your policies is then a member, a voting member of your organization and has a role in the governance structure. Now when we heard about this in Vermont, we heard that this had been created, we also saw that this was a really strong incentive that had been missing in health insurance in the past where there was this idea, well someone else is paying for it, you know, I don't really have to worry about the cost because someone else is paying for it when you have the members owning it, not doctors owning it, not an insurance company owning it, but the members who are covered by the policies owning it, maybe this could create a whole new culture of how we think about and take care of our health. And the little slogan I came up with was, own your health. We own our health. As a co-op, that's what makes us different. We own our health. So that's kind of the direction Um, that I think nationwide those of us involved in this movement have taken. The goal of the Affordable Care Act was that there would be at least one co-op funded in each state to participate in the exchange as something close to the public option. It's not operated by the state but it's owned by its own members and it's democratically controlled which is as close as you could get to a public option. That democratic control was a Uh, a big part of this. The Affordable Care Act included money in it to fund startup loans and reserve loans for these co-ops. One of the biggest obstacles to forming a new insurance company is that you have to walk into the Department of Financial Regulation with five million dollars in reserves just to apply for a license and then you have to have reserves enough to pay all the run out claims if for some reason the premiums stop coming in, you've got to have those reserves. Um, That's the biggest obstacle to entering the market. So the Affordable Care Act recognized this and set up loans for the co-ops. A system was set up for for organizations, community groups, um, existing co-ops, existing nonprofits to apply for these loans and from October of 2011 to December of 2012, 24 co-ops were funded um, by Health and Human Services in uh, 24 different, well, 23 states because Oregon got two uh, funded. But there are a couple of co-ops that cover more than one state, and uh, but for the most part, there there's just one state. And New England is actually co-opt as densely as any other region of this of the country the only state that did not get a co-op funded is uh, New Hampshire, New Hampshire. Uh, but all the other states in New England did get a co-op funded and the 24 that were funded were about 30 to 40 percent of the applications filed so it was an incredibly rigorous process they 
Um, the people at HHS kept saying, no cylindras here. You know, we don't, we're not going to fund anything that's going to fail. <clears throat> we are working together through a national association, NASHCO, the National Association of State Health Cooperatives, um, working together on group purchasing, sharing best practices, sharing expertise. So there's actually, we consider ourselves a national movement. And we had a lot of hopes going forward um, um, with this expanding into all states. We are charged by the Affordable Care Act and the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, Health and Human Services, with being at the forefront of payment reform and health care reform in the state. So if we gain our license and do get to participate on the exchange, our plans uh, from our co-op are going to support the I concept of the primary care medical home where everybody has a primary care team working with them on their health care. We're interested in um, accountable care organization formation where um, doctors and hospitals and other providers work together as a single unit to provide continuous care to you and we give them a budget for your health care and they manage that budget so the carrier doesn't have to be looking over everybody's shoulder. We're very invested in our plans in personal health improvement and wellness and we're going to integrate medical and mental health in a way that I think people really desire. Um, as I said, our insurance license is pending now and we did file a response to the state's RFP to participate on the exchange. <clears throat> but then the fiscal cliff came along. Now the original co-op funding in the Affordable Care Act was significant, six billion dollars for the startup and reserve loans. And the reserve loans in some states are as high as ninety million dollars. It's um, If it's a big state with a lot of people and they're predicting signing up a lot of people, they need to have a big reserve. So for fifty states, at least one in every state, um, there was originally six billion. The debt ceiling negotiations that happened last year, and I think people didn't know this happened, but in those negotiations, the co-ops already went on the chopping block, and 2.2 billion was cut from that original plan. The feds administering the program felt that that meant they could still probably get one in every state, but they would not be able to get multiple co-ops in states like California that probably needed multiple co-ops. But they were moving forward anyway. Through 24 funded, and the funding for those 24 that have been funded like ours is not impacted by anything in the future. We've signed the loan agreements. They're set. It's an obligation of the feds to continue the funding to us. Now, as Tom mentioned, dozens more applied on 1231-12 deadline for the next round of funding. But at the time they were applying, little did they know that in the fiscal cliff negotiations, um, the people who wanted to do the budget cutting in the fiscal cliff negotiation extracted another one, the remaining $1.7 billion that had not been already obligated. All they left behind was enough money for Health and Human Services to oversee the existing loans, but there will be no more co-ops funded. The existing 24 are okay, but, but that's it. That's it. Um, not likely to get restored either, but it was pretty clear when, in the aftermath when the news came out of this that it was people in Congress responding to pressure from the private insurance industry who did not want uh, the co-ops competing on the exchange as democratically governed, member-owned, member-directed plans. They felt it was a big threat and it went, it's the, this is the only item in the Affordable Care Act that got cut in the fiscal cliff. Nothing else got cut, which tells you, um, I guess, what a threat they considered the co-ops to be. So that wraps up my overview and I'm happy to g get into a discussion or answer questions or hear people's reactions.
um, assuming the Vermont Health Exchange Co-op gets funded, how difficult could that be for the out-of-state individual in terms of getting you know, your health care taken care of in an out-of-state hospital, as well as for the hospital in terms of working with these individual co-ops to get the medical bill paid? Can you give us some insight on that? Tom's going to take sure. that one. So, so the qu just to clarify, the question is, uh, if I go with a local co-op, a state <coughs> co-op, uh, the Vermont Health Co-op, and I need services out of state, um, how does that work? Is that basically the question? Okay. Um, and that's a great question. It's one that comes up from the forefront of people's mind. Um, the answer really is, is pretty simple, is that while Vermont will, uh, the Vermont Health Co-op is looking to build a, a local network. Uh, in Vermont, and that's our primary um, set of providers and people we'll be working closely with on uh, payment reform and things like that, um, that there will be a national network. Uh, the same way there's opportunities to do that through rental agreements, uh, the same way currently now uh, or a few years ago MVPs uh, rented Cigna's national network. You know, MVP is a, a local regional uh, provider. Uh, that started in, in New York State and really sort of geographically expanded and, and when they got to uh, had similar growing pains they realized we need to get what's hurting us right now is, is not having a national well-known network um, and they used that opportunity and, and uh, enrolled Cigna to tap into their network. Um, from an individual standpoint um, you've got a recognized network that the hospital will recognize um, and uh, your certificate of coverage outlines what percentage you're responsible for. Um, part of the standardization that's happening within the exchange, um, there won't be a lot of differentiation. The, the state's not allowing that in terms of uh, what your exposure is, what the in individual's exposure is. Um, so basically, it's from your your standpoint, it will be work very similar to the way it works today. And one of the things that makes when information technology makes these things a lot more seamless and a lot more convenient for consumers. So the co-op's website, for example, will have access to a provider directory and you'll be able to, you know, if you are in Kansas City, you will be able to find out who in which hospital in Kansas City is the hospital or which hospitals are the ones that are on our network. And also electronic, the new electronic systems are going to make it seamless for the bill to get paid because you're going to give them your card they're going to be able to tap into our database know that you're covered know what your deductible is know what your co-payments are know where to send the bill and it's all done electronically I think in the old days in the paper-based world getting caught out of state needing health care was a lot more complicated than it is now so we're going to have access to a national network we're going to have a national claims payment network system where it's all electronic and again through our own website and a toll-free number to our office you're going to be able to find out what you need to know. Right. Well I think even simple that if it's an emergency you go oh, to it's an emergency, you, you you're just going to the nearest emergency and, and the rest gets dealt with on the back end. And, and you're, you're protected, plan design protects what your exposure is uh, because you know the same way that if you have a Blue Cross plan today you don't have to look up a network if you're in Nebraska to figure out which hospital you're going to. So it'll, it'll operate the same. If you stub your toe, though, or you step on a pop top, blow out your flip flop down in Florida, you know, and you need to go somewhere, you just, you'll be able to go somewhere. Right. We have uh, a viewer question that goes back to. Uh, the segment you were on before you started explaining about the co-op and, and you know how they come about and funded and whatnot. And that's that uh, someone is asking, can you please clarify your comment that the employer can't subsidize an employee's health care but can give a raise? And can the employer pay to the employee a separate amount in lieu of directly paying the health care premium? Well, this is one of those how does it get interpreted parts of the federal law? Um, if someone goes to the co goes to the Vermont Health Connect to buy their coverage as an individual, they're going to get a bill as an individual. The employer is not going to be able to pay money to the exchange to offset the bill. 
the individual is going to have to pay that premium. It's going to have to be deducted out of the individual's paycheck or they're going to have to write a check every month to pay their share of the premium that isn't covered by a subsidy if they qualify for a subsidy. Now, the if, if the employer goes to the exchange to buy coverage the way they do now through a broker or to a carrier directly, the employer is the one who gets the bill for everybody. The employer collects money from payroll and then puts their own money in and sends the whole check off to the, the carriers the way that would happen now. And the exchange is going to take the place of that. The money either goes to the exchange or the employer you know, contributes the money to the exchange, whatever. But if an individual is going as an individual, not part of an employer group, there's no way for the employer to make a tax deductible payment to help pay for that employee's premium. There's just no mechanism, mechanism or legal way to do it. And the federal law, in order to make sure that the subsidies were really based on the individual's own income, don't allow an employer to pay any part of it unless it's taxable to the employee and taxable to the employer, which would be mean you could pay you can give a salary increase to somebody. It's not guaranteeing that they're going to use it to pay for the premium. You can give them a bonus, it's not going to guarantee. And in either case it's going to raise their it's going to raise their income so they're eligible for less subsidy. It's also going to in expose both the employer and the employee to higher taxes. So it's kind of hard to figure out how much are you going to, how much of a raise can you give before they lose enough subsidy to make, you know. But it's household income, correct? And it's household income. So you only have yeah. to the equation some, sometimes. Right. And it is, the subsidies are calculated based on household income. So that's what I meant, that the employer either needs to get in as the employer and make a direct premium payment to the exchange for their employees and then the rest of it comes in from the employees um, or the employer walks away from the whole thing or the employer says I'm going to give you all a raise and your taxes are going to go up but you can use the raise to go to the exchange yourself but then the employer has no say in it at all. I hope that's clear. Is that people in the room are saying yes I hope that's clear. And I guess the, the, the big point is you can't have both. You can't have employer contribution uh, and, and a subsidy. And a subsidy. Yeah. So a follow-up question to that from someone else um, is asking, um, what's what's the employer incentive to provide insurance through the exchange? Today, it's probably for you know for a lot of small employers competitive reasons. You know, if you want to get the best employees. You know, you have to compete with other employers, but is some of that going, some of that pressure going to change with all this newfound health insurance scenario in Vermont? That's, that's a great question, and I think it's um, it's always been an employee retention, and there, there's uh, been some employers feel it's their obligation, it's their you know requirement to offer a good benefits package in order to retain employees um, or to take care of their employees. And I think that people will evaluate that. And I think it will largely depend on, um, as we get closer, how clear this process is, how uh, certainly the f financial impact. Uh, the one piece I think people are overlooking is the, um, uh, or at least for now, and I think it will become clearer and clearer, is what's the actual tax impact? Um, and, and, and how does it hit people's bottom lines when you start running the numbers? Uh, I, I also believe that it will, to some extent, depend on what type of industry you're in, uh, how competitive is it in terms of uh, what, how big are you, your, your company size, you know, and, and, and sort of some of the hiring dynamics that you go through. And uh, that when people look at overall benefit packages, they run it through that same prism. But it's certainly, I think people will look at it again. Well, one of the things that, one of the questions that came up earlier that has been resolved is what if you are in a business that's on a border in Vermont and you have employees who are residents of another state? And when Vermont legislature created the, Ver the Vermont Health Connect, they allowed employers to buy into the exchange for 
their employees who are residents outside of Vermont. So an employer who has Vermont and New Hampshire residents would still be able to cover all the employees as a group through the Vermont Exchange. Individuals, however, have to be residents of Vermont to enter into the exchange as individuals. So that question was at least resolved. When I think it through, it seems to me that a big dividing point is what is the payroll, your average payroll? What, what, it, what is your pay scale like? A group of accountants or lawyers or engineers, a firm that does environmental engineering kind of work, um, architects, because of the pay scale that those people have, they're probably not likely to qualify for subsidies. And the employer can never make up for the loss of the employer contribution to premium for those people by sending them as individuals. If the employer sends them as individuals, drops out, the architectural firm drops out, those people go as individuals. The employer is only penalizing the employees because giving them a bonus is going to raise their taxes. They're not going to qualify for a subsidy. So what would be the point of doing that? The employer is going to, is going to really owe those employees a a benefit in the employee's mind as far as the retention and recruitment. They, the employer wants to offer something. The best thing to do is to keep offering the insurance, to me it seems. At the other end of the scale is the gas station or the deli or you know the really small business which is m minimum wage or barely livable wage. Those folks, those families are likely to get a good subsidy by going to the exchange directly. And the employer might not have been paying much more than 50% of the premium and only for the individual anyway. I mean, these are the employers at that, at that range are generally not making much of a contribution anyway. They're not generally offering family coverage. So whatever they make up in a small salary increase or a bonus isn't going to affect the tax status of that person and wipe out their subsidies enough to make a difference. So the real complicated thing is if you're in the middle. If you're an employer in the middle and you've got some high wage and you've got some low wage or everybody's kind of in the middle in the 60,000, 40 to 60,000 range, it's really hard to tell right. what's going to be right for them. And, and that's part of the reason that uh, they are requiring the rates to come out so early. Yeah, the premiums. The premiums, the pricing. So I think that to give people an, uh, the opportunity to look at this and really f sort of look granular at your own organization and, and, and make these types of decisions. Uh, and that's, I think that's the goal of the pricing coming out in August so that you have three, f you know, four or five months to actually look at it and, and make these decisions. And there will be, as I mentioned, at least 30 plans to choose from when, if, if we do get the f two federal carriers as well, there's going to be a range. And they're going to range from the platinum down to the bronze and then within the bronze there are going to be some of these choice plans that may offer innovations that keep the premium even lower. Like I said, trading a broad network choice for a narrow network, you could probably keep the premium down. And then the employer's choice is going to be, well, do I want to say, do I want to move to a defined contribution model where I say I'm going to pay 70% of the bronze high deductible health plan that's offered by so and so because that's the best price. So I'm going to pay, that's what I'm going to pay. You go and get whatever plan you want, but that's what I'm paying and you'll have to make up the rest as an individual, as an employee. The employer could do that or the employer could say, could pick the plan and say that's the plan we're all getting because they don't want there to be any fighting in house. Well, she went and got that plan because she earns more and I mean, there are many choices for employers to make, and it might not be a bad idea to discuss this with employees. What are the what are the consequences of us going one way or another? Um, so I'm not sure that I heard that right, Jean. Okay. Did you just say that an employer could tell their employees, "I'm going to pay X percent of some level of plan, pick a plan," but let the employee go choose 
which plan they actually want. We, we, the, the rules haven't been set yet by Vermont Health Connect, but that is one of the options allowed under the Affordable Care Act. The state can, the state can set the rules so that the in the employer uh, part of the exchange, which is called the shop exchange, the small business exchange, that the empl there are many options of how the state could go. They could say the employer chooses the plan the carrier, the plan, every employee gets the same plan. Or the employer can basically choose what their benchmark is and say, I'm going to make a contribution based on this plan, but if you want to buy up to a gold or a platinum, you know, have at it, it's your money. Or the employer could say, I'm going to buy from this carrier, I'll pay I'll pay X percent of a plan from this carrier, you choose which plan you want from that carrier. We don't know yet what Vermont's going to allow, but there may be some pretty broad options. I think it's going to be, any way it shakes out, there's always going to be an opportunity for the employer to say, make it a defined contribution, where the employer's amount that they contribute every year is fixed. And if it's a high deductible health plan an HSA, that's HSA or HRA qualified, that's another way the employer can participate by making a contribution into the HSA or the HRA on behalf of the employee to reduce that exposure. So depending on how broad those options are mm -hmm. set by the state, it's, do I understand correctly, it's possible you could have employees getting plans from different carriers yeah. and that would be possible because the employer is paying the premium to the exchange, yes. not to the carriers. Yes. And depending on how many employees you have, that makes open enrollment pretty complicated. And depending on how Vermont Health Connect is able to build its back office, it would have to allow first the employer to make that kind of a decision, and then every employee, when they get in and enroll, they would be sitting at the portal and deciding among the choices that their employer option allowed. So we don't. I've, I've got a feeling they're going to go as simple as they can in devising this, at least for the first <coughs> year. Um, but um, it ought to offer an opportunity for employees to make have more choice than they have now, where the employer basically chooses the plan everybody gets. The idea of the exchange was choice. That was that was the idea behind it federally. What about uh, HRAs and HSAs that lots of employers offer now in varying degrees? You had mentioned that earlier, Tom, that that definitely would still be an option. But what do you think are going to be the mechanics of actually doing that? Is it going to be provided or administered by each carrier or separately by the state or other organizations? Or how's that all going to work? I think that, that, that the actual, well, the HRA, um, for for the groups greater than 50, of course, that won't change. That's a big part of the HRA or HRA market. Uh, in terms of the HSA uh, and the HRAs that are you know 20 to 50, I don't think the mechanics will change a lot. Um, I think that there will need to be some level of coordin coordination because uh, right now, when an employer provides a plan. It's very straightforward what everybody has and they know. And as Jeannie just outlined, um, that employer now may be in an environment, depending how they write the rules, where they don't really know what their employees, you know, they pick a baseline and then they may have employees doing different things. Uh, for example, the way Jeannie outlined it, um, if the state chooses to do this, uh, you could have an employer, employee who the employer offers an HSA, the employee for their individual circumstances buys up and then isn't eligible for HSA contributions. Um, so that would put them in a, you know, in a, in a problem, in, in a situation from a tax perspective. But I don't think the mechanics are going to change, at least immediately, Joe. Um, I think that they're happy to let that business, uh, the way that the mechanics work and the way it's operating, to allow that to continue. So, the, for they example, the carrier is selling an, H, uh, an HSA qualified plan. The carrier would help the employer line up the way the HSAs are set up. Right. The carriers would still 
the state isn't going to start running HSAs. Right. The carriers, if the carrier is selling an HSA plan, it has to help people set those well, or, HSAs or the, up. Or the brokers, or the, or, or the, right. you know, the HR administrators, the same way they, they do currently. It's just find a financial institution that they're working with and, right. and do a direct payroll deposit in okay. the same way. So I don't see the mechanics changing immediately. Well, one thing that happened in the Affordable Care Act that people in the insurance industry paid a lot of attention to, but I don't know the public learned much about it, is the Affordable Care Act actually set a maximum administrative cost that any health plan can have. It, it, that used to be something that state insurance regulators were supposed to be watching and making sure that most of the money you paid in premiums was going out the door in claims. Right. It's called the minimum loss ratio. How much of your premiums are paid in claims versus a admin? And the federal law said that for um, individual plans, non-group plans, and small group plans, the maximum administrative cost could be 20%. And for large group plans, the maximum administrative cost could be 15 So that means either 80% of the money is going out the door in claims or 85% is going out in claims. In Vermont, the carriers would be delighted to be able to have 15 to 20 percent. <laughs> They're sometimes running deficits on admin. They're paying 95 percent out on claims or 98 percent. It's not very high in Vermont because they're nonprofits for the most part. Um, so we're all having to meet that standard anyway. And that, that, and they define it in a way that is pretty broad. The things that you spend money on wellness wellness activities in some in some of the wellness activities that you would think of wouldn't get charged as admin they they add up to your minimum loss ratio admin so we're all going to be having to watch that the same way i think though that i would turn your your assumption kind of on its head by saying we're coming in without fixed costs we're coming in with a very small staff that we don't have to worry about laying people off in order to meet the minimum loss ratio. We're coming in without owning a building. We're coming in without history, you know. Um, and we're coming in with a loan to provide our backing. Um, you know, we didn't have to collect that in premiums in past years, so uh, we have to repay it in 15 years. I didn't mention that, by the way. The startup loan has to be repaid in five, and the reserve loan uh, for the reserves has to be paid back in 15 years. We have to be on our own feet right. by then. Right. But Tom may have something else to say well, about no, that. No, I, I think your points are right, and I think um, I think it's a, a very fair question. I think the the model, uh, the application process, really uh, gave the co-op, while it's it's uh, uh, certainly an advantage in Vermont, in other parts of the country, it carries you know no weight. So the 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 business plan really had to stand on its own two feet and say, how, as a new carrier, are you going to break into a market with zero market share and become, uh, you know, uh, liquid and, and sustainable? And how's that going to work? And they had, we had actuaries, you know, we had our actuaries put things together. They had their actuaries tear them apart and, and see if it, it really made sense. Uh, now, the co-op will absolutely be competing on cost. Um, as Gene said, uh, while we, you know, one of the things we don't have 
is a legacy cost and fixed costs and a, a you know a pension scheme that we are stuck with. Uh, and, um, it's kind of like being the new airline. Yeah, that, that's a great analogy. Right. Yeah, actually, it is. Um, so I, I think you know we absolutely uh, plan on competing on cost as well as as the sort of the co-op model and, and delivering a, a different uh, set of healthcare alternatives. The um, you know one of the things that we have as a startup, I mean, uh, there's we belong to a national association as well. And similar, similar to the way that, it, that the credit union association can sort of gather credit unions and exchange ideas and provide a whole layer of value, um, we're plugged into a, a national organization that does the same thing. But I think the, I think the issue of not having the legacy costs right. and um, being able to scale up as our enrollment demands it rather than starting up having to support 600 employees because where we do come in on a level playing ground is that everybody that I mentioned before all those individuals and all those small businesses who have to sign up for a new plan January 1st 2014 nobody gets to renew the plan they have nobody so we're going in on a level playing field in terms of that even if Blue Cross has 60 percent of the market now everybody comes to zero on January 1st 2014 so we're competing we will be if we get our license we're competing on that level playing field to begin with and we think because of our low because we don't have the legacy costs and because our whole point is to be innovative we don't owe anybody anything um, and we respond and we're here for no other reason than our members like like you folks are. We exist for no other reason than to provide a financial service to our members. Well, we're, we're optimistic that we'll, that we'll do fine. So I, have a um, so I understand right now we're focusing on small employers. What's the co-op's future for large employers? Actually, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking Thank that. you for asking that because <laughs> it, it, before you said it, I didn't realize it wasn't even the presentation. Uh, so the co-op will be available to large employers once it's licensed. Um, this, the presentation is focused on what's going to happen and, and, and where things are going. Uh, but the co-op will be available uh, for large employers as soon as it's licensed. In fact, it'll be available earlier than it, as soon as it's licensed. Ideally, that would be June, July, well, licensed earlier, but we'd be able to actually offer product, uh, or hopefully we can offer product uh, for sort of the mid-year renewal cycle. And uh, that business would look very much the same way it does today um, in terms of we can accommodate uh, a range of funding mechanisms, plan designs, uh, etc. We have, you know, we'll have our own actuarial we have our own actuarial function that'll be able to work with larger employers to right. price the different plan options and things depend in because the rating is going is different for large employers for those of you who don't know small employers are in a community rate where everybody's charged exactly the same regardless of gender age industry or whatever but larger employers can be somewhat based on their own experience and and the makeup of their so it's a different rating system, but we will have the capability of doing that just like any other carrier once we're licensed. So, Gene Tom, I, as a follow-up to that, I recall, I think I recall, I don't know if it's still the case, that um, beyond uh, January 1st, 2014, and employers of 50 or less mandated to go through the exchange and individuals, isn't it, isn't it like a year later that it's employers of 100 or less or something? Or has that 2016. changed? 2016, yes. two years later. Okay. Yes, you're right. In 2016, <coughs> the exchange opens up at the federal level. It opens up to any employer um, up to 100. Up to 100. And the big debate in Vermont last year was whether it, the exchange would be up to 100 right away. And because it was clear the legislature was going to make the exchange the only place people eligible for the exchange could buy there was a pushback by some of the larger employers to say no leave us leave us out until we know this is going to work and uh, so 2016 so what happens to an employer with 51 or 99 employees um, that um, 
middle of 2014 uh, sees the plans available and the pricing and options through the exchange and and they want to participate in the exchange but they're not mandated to that that's not allowed yet they have to right. do things individually well, first I want to make sure we're understanding mandating nobody's mandated right. you employers are not required still to offer health insurance so it's not there's no mandate it's you know compelled to buy through the exchange if you want to buy but th anyway um, if you're over 50 if you're an employer of over 50 and the state law sets up these definitions for if you're seasonal and you kind of go up and down and up and down what happens to you so if you're in the 45 to 55 range you might qualify for the exchange and then even if you go slightly above 50 you're allowed to stay in it until it looks like you're going to be above 50 forever then you have to leave again but anyway um, if you are over 50 under the current Vermont law you do not have an opportunity to buy through the exchange you just don't have that opportunity but the carriers are very likely to sell similar plans um, it's just a question of whether the rates are going to be better or worse for you because you're not in the community rated pool right. well one other thing about the, Verm the way Vermont's well the way the Affordable Care Act set up the exchange and this is kind of getting a little into the weeds but I think it's useful if a carrier attracts for whatever reason a disproportionate share of unhealthy people there's a rating mechanism to that um, assigns the risk kind of a risk score to the people you attract so that the other carriers who did not get a high number of not very well people they have to actually take pre they, the state will take premium money away from them and give it to the plan that has the higher risk people now this is a really important consideration because it means there is absolutely no incentive now for any carrier to discourage sick people from joining them and there's every reason for a carrier and we're really happy about this to attract people who aren't well and do a good job with them to say if you've got diabetes we've got a great program for you there's no disincentive for a carrier now to do things that really are good for sick people if you've got the best AIDS doctor or you've got the best cardiovascular surgeon or whatever it is good rehab programs you're going you are going to get rewarded by the state in this kind of leveling mechanism they're building but that's another think about the back office for that <laughs> that you got to do in the IT system but that would happen after the first year there would be a retrospective review and money would kind of change hands but I think a lot of people have been concerned about this cherry picking idea that well you know I don't want to go to the plan that's going to attract the sick people because our rates will go up well it's there's no there's no worry about that in the exchange and that was set up at the federal level to make sure there's no discrimination against sick people um, another viewer question is will consumers be penalized for not choosing a plan individuals regulatory stuff. Yes. <laughs> um, in, under the Affordable Care Act there is an individual mandate to have coverage and if you don't prove with your tax filing that you have creditable coverage and it could be an employer plan could be an exchange plan could be Medicare could be you're covered by a state government plan like Medicaid could be Veterans Administration you have to be able to prove creditable coverage or you're penalized um, I can't even remember how much it is. A couple, few thousand dollars. Yeah, it's it's um, the way the Catamount assessment was to employers. That's the way this is to individuals. It's not compelling enough to run out. I don't think and, and buy insurance. Um, but there will be a penalty. There's also a penalty for employers over 50 that don't provide coverage. A federal penalty that would be similar it, but it's a little stiffer than the cat amount but it's still not as much as you would pay for an individual premium it's a couple thousand dollars a year per employee right. there is no penalty for the under 50 employer however and that's why this question of the under 50 employers are they going to stay in the game or are they going to just let their employees go 
they do have that flexibility without paying a penalty, at least at the federal level. I did see a news story yesterday that Representative Paul Poirier has introduced a bill to eliminate the catamount assessment on employers once the exchange starts because we aren't going to be subsidizing catamount anymore. Right. And the question is whether the state wants to continue that assessment and provide additional state subsidies for people or use it to pay for the Medicaid expansion or something. But that's going to be a debate this, this session, whether or not the catamount assessment continues. And that does apply to employers under 50, but no federal penalty. So uh, a follow-up question, I assume, from the same person that asked the prior one, is who collects the penalty uh, that you were just talking about, and how does the penalizer ensure that they get those dollars of that penalty? Well, it's going to be done through the IRS. The federal penalty um, would be done through the IRS. As far I don't, I think the employer penalty? I'm not sure what mechanism was set up for that. I don't, I don't That's a really good question and I'll have to go do some research on that. But I know that for the individuals it, it's part of your tax filing and if you don't, if you can't provide the credit, the, cert, the evidence of creditable coverage, you get hit on your tax bill. The same way that if you are eligible for a tax, for a subsidy for your premium, it's in the form of a tax credit. So IRS is going to be involved for individuals, but I need to mm. research how and for, get done. for employers, if you apply the same thought process, it might be through payroll ta related it might taxes, be right? The same way you file your payroll right. I'm not sure. Yeah. Social Security Administration or something. I don't know. I'll look that up and get back to you. Thanks. I have a question uh, regarding the employee number and the FTE calculation. It's my understanding. A uh, full-time employee that you must cover is works 30 or more hours a week, so that's the threshold. Mm -hmm. So those employers that are over 50, or you count your numbers based on 30 hours per week, uh, that don't offer insurance for folks that are working less than 40 hours, now have to offer that insurance. Or pay a penalty. Or pay the penalty. Right. Right. And. As we approach this deadline, I'm sure lots of people, um, your payroll administrators and current insurance brokers and other financial advisors are going to have little tools and um, things to help calculate all of this and the definitions for how you calculate it. But it is based on FTEs, not employees. Yeah. So if we don't offer insurance to uh, an individual working less than 40 hours, we pay a penalty and they're required to go to the exchange? So well, yeah. they're, they don't have they're eligible to go to the exchange because they're not offered your coverage. Yeah. They aren't required to. They could also choose to pay the penalty. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And some people will. I mean, we've got one of the most generous public plans in the country, the Catamount plan. Um, people are eligible um, up to 300 percent of poverty. These subsidies, by the way, are going to go up to 400 percent of poverty, the federal subsidies, but at the top end they're pretty small. But anyway, we've got an incredibly generous program. Every kid in Vermont is eligible for Dr. Dinosaur. We've done everything we can. We subsidize. The plans have very low deductibles. They're very attractive. And we've still got 8 percent uninsured. And half of those people we know for a fact are eligible for Medicaid and won't sign up for it. And Medicaid doesn't even have premium contributions or out-of-pocket exposure. So there's just, it, it, there's just this n group of folks who don't want coverage, who don't want record keeping, or whatever reason they have, it's, it's, a, it's a tough nut to crack to get to 100%, to get to true universal. But at least the opportunity is out there. You know, we're making the opportunity available for Universal. You can't force people to get coverage and people who aren't filing taxes, you know, if you're not filing taxes, they're not going to know you're uninsured. So th we know that those people are out there. So, Did we touch on the employer provided opt-out incentives yet? Does anything in that area change or 
Is it all the same as it always has been? I, I don't know of anything that's changed, Joe. Um, but I actually expect some of these ideas are going to be discussed in this session of the legislature. I think more and more employers are going to be concerned. They're going to be asking for clarification. Clarification is going to uh, create some, uh, you know, ideas of, of how to either get in front of some of this stuff or support different ideas. I, I think there's, you're going to see a pretty active session in terms of how to fix things before proceed to perceive problems or situations or clar look for clarification because uh, it, it certainly is going to create a lot of it's a lot of people are going to have to make a lot of decisions all at once um, in an area that they really haven't a lot of people haven't thought about for a while uh, and it's going to push it's going to push some different financial decisions you know as as we wrap up our discussion here uh, the one overriding thing that comes to mind is assuming that the timeline uh, set by the state holds true and everything goes perfectly well and there's no bumps in the road at all um, you know the thought occurs to me that you know we've got people viewing this information session and we appreciate all of the insights you're sharing still a lot of unanswered questions but but that'll come out uh, but viewers here are learning about this and there have been some other opportunities here and there around the state to do things similar to this but I've got to believe that the masses of small employers and consumers uh, you know are pretty much in the dark on what's happening or have some vague awareness that something's happening but you know what I haven't heard about is any kind of communications plan or is the whole plan dependent on current insurers communicating everything to their insured um, or do you think the state of Vermont has some kind of consumer awareness education kind of effort coming out or how, how are small employers in particular and consumers going to find out about what are my options, where do I go, what's changing? That's a good question. I, I think there are going to be outreach efforts um, and I think we're in, a, we're in a unique time now where there's even though it's, it's less than a year away there's n to some extent there's not a lot to talk about until rates you know people know rates so I think it's a little bit of a chicken egg I know there's a, a, a big outreach initiative um, being conducted uh, and I think it's now it's just with the change in mediums and, and where do you how do you get to people I think it's just a real it's going to evolve it's got to happen quick um, but you know, it's, I think it's going to be an interesting year. The state, the Department of Financial Regulation, and the, the the exchange is actually run by the Division of Vermont Health Access, right. DIVA, which is the division of the Agency for Human Services that runs Medicaid and Catamount and other health plans. DIVA is the group that's running the exchange, um, and they have so much on their plates so many moving parts to this that getting the health plan the qualified health plans set up finding out what the rates are going to be getting the back office built um, filing their reports with the feds to keep getting the money they're getting to plan the exchange um, they've got so many balls up in the air that the idea of going out and doing outreach programs to employers and individuals has uh, they've been trying. I know they've yeah. they've they've held some plans, some programs, and they tend to be working with other organizations to kind of show up at a meeting that exists um, to you know take advantage of that. I know they've been trying, but considering how much they've got in the air, I think Tom is right. Until some of these decisions are made that they have to make in their own you know in their own offices. What are we going to let employers, what kind of latitude as far as choice are we going to let the employers have? How is that going to run? What are the rates going to be? How many plans are going to be offered? Until those questions are settled, these meetings generate more questions than you right. can answer, right. as you can see here. Right. And, um, and, and it, sorry, I don't mean to cut yeah, you off. Okay. But I think in fairness, too, uh, this, this was all decided at the legislature level last year. Um, and now they've been trying to build an organization to carry it out carry it out and execute on those um, and this timeline that was dictated to them 
and um, you know I think that there was a fair amount of coverage in the news last year when some of these decisions were made. And, but you're right, most I'm not sure the masses of small employers it's, are, are aware of it. Um, but you know there's a there's a, a lot to do in terms of execution, and I think that they're 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 out there. They're if you're if you're looking for information, they're they're conducting sessions and they're doing a good job of getting you're trying to get geographically around the state and listen to people. They're holding uh, some stakeholder, shareholder, interest focus groups, um, trying to tap in to find out what's important to employers. Uh, but uh, I think you're right, Joe, in terms of the, the the depth and the breadth and touching a lot of people that need to understand it. I, I think that that's, um, you know, we're not there yet. I would expect, like, starting in May, they're going to have enough information to start talking to people about here are the decisions you've got to make and here right. here here's the range of choices you're going to have um, here are the things you need to be thinking about they'll they'll have a little more meat on the bones to be able to offer something that specific and so will the rest of us right. well you're exactly right that uh, sessions like this generate questions and that's a good thing but it just generated another question mm -hmm. um, and that's the something along the lines of if a small employer uh, decides, and I assume this is a, b a border <coughs> uh, employer, uh, may or may not be a credit union, but let's say border from Mountain Hampshire, but I suppose it could be any state. Um, if the small employer on that border decides not to offer insurance to its employees, um, so what's available in this case for the New Hampshire resident that's working for that Vermont employer in Vermont? How does that all shake out? New Hampshire is operating its own exchange, isn't it, or is it, is it having the feds operate the exchange? Uh, that's an impression. It's having the fed operate. They wouldn't, yeah. take, they wouldn't take any money. Right. But I think what basically your employee, if you're not offering a group plan, I mean, it's I don't think it uh, looks a lot different than today. If you're not offering a group plan, you know, what's available in the individual market? Uh, if there's enough, if there's enough employees in the New Hampshire market, then they may be able to do a group New Hampshire plan. You know, sometimes you can. But there will be there'll be a it Vermont it exchange and a New Hampshire yeah. exchange. In the New Hampshire exchange, the Vermont one will be Vermont Health Connect run by DIVA. And in New Hampshire, the feds are running the exchange because states had the option of not running the exchange themselves. The irony being, of course, that a bunch of states that don't like to be told by the federal government what to do <laughs> said, we're not going to run an exchange. Well, we and what they got was the feds running their exchange. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there will be some mechanism in New Hampshire that people f resident of New Hampshire will be able to use to buy plans that the feds qualified for New Hampshire. So the Vermont, no, the New Hampshire resident mm -hmm. doesn't get insurance provided through the Vermont employer, gets insurance from the exchange in the state in which they're domiciled. Yes, right. but, or, or but, or, or not necessarily the exchange, but it, the individual market. But the employer in Vermont would not, I do not believe, would be allowed to cover only their Vermont employees through the Vermont exchange. It would have to be the employer was out right. of it entirely, and all the employees became individuals in their state of domicile. You see what I mean? Because mm -hmm. yep. the, the Vermont employer could buy for even New Hampshire resident employees through the Vermont Exchange now, if the if the employer wants to go to the shop exchange right. in and Vermont. They would be required to if they're operating to any of the Vermont employees. Yeah, they wouldn't be able to pick which yeah. ones they're covering. They'd have to offer the same terms to everybody, yeah. 40 hours, everybody. Right. And, yeah. and, and I think this is, a, this is a great example of, uh, while the concept is everybody has a choice to be in, in or out, and, and it's the employer's choice, um, I think when people look at their individual situations, some people's hands um, are going to be forced one way or the other because it's just, it's too disruptive otherwise. Um, if, if they do something one way or the other or do too much different than offer an employer a uh, sponsored plan. The contribution levels may change, the coverage may change, you know, the funding mechanism may change whether it's an HSA or traditional plan, but I think that uh, a lot of employers are going to retain group coverage. Um, They're just buying it through the exchange yeah, rather than exchange, right. directly from a carrier. Because otherwise it's just too disruptive for their employees and they don't they don't want to upset their you know their workforce and their their colleagues. 
we have no more questions from viewers at the moment, uh, but we see how much longer we probably will. Um, so before that happens, because we've kept you over our intended time. Oh wow! Did not. I went fast. fast. Um, we really <laughs> appreciate your time here. Um, but here's the opportunity for the uh, unabashed plug. If people <laughs> want to find out more about the Vermont Health Co-op. How do they do that? Uh, our website www.vermonthealth.coop And it's part, you know, you'll find under construction signs because we're not a licensed health insurer yet, but you can find contact information. Our offices are located in South Burlington and um, we, you know, we'd ha be happy to answer what we can and uh, right. Stay tuned. I guess is the <laughs> is the answer. Stay Correct. tuned. And I'd, I'd also offer just you know the channel any questions through Joe. Thank you very much, uh, Gene and Tom, for the time that you've spent with us and all the information provided. I'm sure everybody appreciates it. Very interesting conversation. You're right. A lot more questions yet to be answered, but uh, this is great for now. And I'm sure that we'll be leaning on you again in the not too distant future uh, as details uh, develop as we get closer to that enrollment time. Uh, so thank you to all of our viewers, everybody in the room here today. Uh, this concludes our broadcast, and uh, have a good day.